When Zarathustra was thirty years old, he left his home and the lake of his home, and he went into the mountains. Here he enjoyed his spirit and solace, and would for ten years not weary of them. But in the end his heart transformed. And one morning he stood before the morning red, approached the sun, and spake unto it thus, Thou greatest star, what of thy joy? Had ye not those for whom ye shine? Ten years ye came up to my cave, ye would of thine light and thine circuits been sated, if not for my eagle, my serpent, and I. But every morning we waited for thee, and took from thee thine overflow, and for it blessed thee. See, with my wisdom am I overladen, like unto a bee, who of the honey has gathered too much, so too I ask for hands outstretched. I want to hand out and give away, till the wise of mankind once again of their folly, and the poor once again of their riches have gladdened. For this must I in depth uprise, as ye do in the evening skies, when ye go neath the sea, yet even to the underworld light ye bring, ye over-rich star. I must, like thee, undergo, as man names it, to whom I will to go down. So bless me then, thou tranquil eye, who without envy can behold an all too great felicity. Bless the cup that wills for this, to overflow, that from it golden water may flow, and mantle over everything a mirror of thy joy. See, this cup wills again to be empty, and Zarathustra wills again to be human. Thus began Zarathustra's undergoing. Zarathustra arose down the mountains alone, and nobody encountered him. But as he came into the woods, there stood up a sudden an old man before him, having left his holy hut to root around for roots in the wood. And thus spake the old man to Zarathustra, No stranger is this wanderer to me. Many years hence he went past here. Zarathustra was he called, but he has been transformed. Once into mountains ye bore thine ashes, thine fire will ye now bear into valleys? Fear ye not the Promethean punishment? Yes, I recognize Zarathustra. Pure is his eye, and in his mouth there hides no disgust. Goes he not, therefore, as a dancer? Zarathustra is transformed. Become a child has Zarathustra. Zarathustra is awakened. What wills he for those who sleep? Like one at sea ye lived in solace, and the ocean carried thee. O oh, woe, ye will to come to land? O oh, woe, to haul thy corpse again? Spake Zarathustra, I love humankind. Why, asked the holy man, into the woods went I, or into the desert? Was it not because I all too much loved humankind? Now love I God, humankind I love not. The human to me is too meager a thing. Love for mankind was my undertaker. Zarathustra answered, What spake I of love? I take to humankind a gift. Give them nothing, said the holy man. Rather take something from them, and carry it with thee. That will do thee much better, if it does thee good alone. And if ye will still give them aught, then give unto them naught but alms, and let them still beg for them. No, answered Zarathustra, no alms give I, for that I am not poor enough. The holy man laughed over Zarathustra, and spake unto him thus, See to it then that they accept thy treasures, for they mistrust the hermit, and won't believe that such as we come bearing gifts. To them our steps sound all too lonely in the alleyways, and when at night they're in their beds they hear a man a-passin' overhead, long afore the sun arises, and they ask themselves, Where wills the thief? So go ye not to humankind, but stay here in the woods, Go rather unto beasts, why not be as I, a bear among bears, a bird among birds? And what does the holy man do in the woods? Zarathustra asked. 
The holy man answered, I make songs and sing them, and when making songs I laugh, weep, and mumble. Thus I praise the God. With singing and weeping and laughing and mumbling praise I the God who is my God. But what bring ye to me as a gift? When Zarathustra heard these words, saluted he the holy man, and spake, What have I to give thee? Nay, let me make me swift away, lest I take something from thee. And so they parted from each other, the old and the younger, laughing, just as two young lads would laugh. But when Zarathustra was alone, spake he thus unto his heart, Could it really be said? that this old saint within his woods has not yet heard that God is dead. When Zarathustra reached the nearest town that by the forest lay, found he there a motley mob convening round the market, for it was given out that there they would a tightrope dancer see. And spake Zarathustra unto the mob, I teach to you the superhuman! Humans are something to be superseded. What have you done to supersede them? All being so far has surpassed itself, and of this great flow the ebb you would be? Back unto beasts you would rather retreat than the human being to supersede? What is the monkey for the man, a laughing stock or a wincing shame? And so shall man for superman be, a laughing stock or a wincing shame. A way you made from worms to man, and much in you is still but worm. Once you were monkeys, yet even now is man more monkey than any monkey. Mismatch and mixture of spectre and weed, such is even the wisest of you. Who calls you to be but spectres and weeds? See, I teach you. THE SUPERHUMAN! THE SUPERHUMAN IS THE SENSE OF THE EARTH. LET YOUR WILL SAY, THE SUPERHUMAN SHALL BE THE SENSE OF THE EARTH. MY BROTHERS, I SUMMON YOU, STAY TRUE TO THE EARTH, AND BELIEVE NOT THEM WHO TELL YOU OF SUPER-EARTHLY HOPES. POISONERS ARE THEY, WHETHER THEY KNOW IT OR NOT. SCORNERS OF THE BODY ARE THEY, SELF-POISONING AND WASTING AWAY. OF THEM THE EARTH IS WEARY, SO THITHER MAY THEY RETURN. ONCE TO BLASPHEME AGAINST GOD WAS THE GREATEST BLASPHEMY, BUT GOD HAS DIED, AND WITH HIM ALL THAT'S BLASPHEMOUS DIED TOO. NOW IS THE MOST TERRIBLE THING TO BLASPHEME GAINST THE EARTH, AND HOLD THE UNKNOWN'S INNARDS HIGHER THAN THE SENSE OF THE EARTH. Once the soul disdainfully glanced down upon the body, once down-looking was the highest thing. They wanted it meagre, ghastly, and starved, for they thought to hatch from it and the earth. Oh, this soul itself was once so meagre, ghastly, and underfed, for cruelty was back then the very lusting of this soul. Yet thus to-day you speak, my brothers, what heralds your body of your soul? Is not your soul in poverty, filth, and wretched contentment? Truly a man is a filthy stream. One must be already a sea around a filthy stream to drink it up without polluted being. See, I teach you the superhuman. They are this sea, and in them can your greatest disgust undergo. What is the greatest thing you can endure? The hour of the great disgust, the hour when your very joy turns to disgust, and with it your reason and your virtue. In that hour when you say, What matters my joy? It's poverty, filth, and pathetic contentment, and yet my joy should justify existence itself. In that hour when you say, What of my reason? Longs it for knowledge as lions for prey? It's poverty, filth, and pathetic contentment. In that hour when you say, What of my virtue? She has yet to make me rage. How weary am I of my good and my evil, all poverty, filth, and pathetic contentment. In that hour when you say, What of my justice? I see in me nothing of embers and coals, but the just of this world are embers and coals. 
in that hour when you say, Oh, what about my sympathy? Is not one sympathy the cross on which he shall be nailed who loves all humankind? But my sympathy is no crucifixion. Have you ever spoken so? Have you ever shrieken so? Oh, that I had heard you shriek! You say your sins do shriek to heaven? Nay, but your frugality, your parsimony with your sins, that is what now shrieks to heaven. Oh, where is the lightning that would lick you with its tongue? Oh, whence the madness with which you should be inoculated? See, I teach you the superhuman. They are this lightning, they are this madness. When Zarathustra had spoken thus, shrieked one of the mob. Of the tightrope dancer we have heard more than enough, but let us now see him as well. And all the mob laughed over Zarathustra. But the tightrope dancer, thinking that the speech was meant for him, set himself to work. But Zarathustra looked upon the mob and wondered, then spake he thus, Man is a rope, tied twixt beast and superhuman, a rope over an abyss, a perilous crossing over, a perilous on the way, a perilous backward glancing, a perilous shudder and standing still. What is great in man is this, that he is a bridge and not an end. What can be loved in man is this, that he goes over and undergoes. Him I love who knows not how to live except to undergo, for he is crossing overhead. I love the great disdainers, for they are the great admirers and shafts that long for the opposite shore. Him I love who does not seek behind the stars his grounds to be a sacrifice, to undergo, but rather he who to the earth will sacrifice himself, that she will some day birth the superhuman. Him I love who lives that he may know, and wills that he may know, so that some day the superman may live, for thus he wills his undergoing. Him I love who labors and invents that he may build the superhuman a house, and for him earth and beasts and plants prepares, for thus he wills his undergoing. Him I love who loves his virtue, virtue is a longing arrow, and the will to undergo. Him I love who not a drop of spirit keeps unto himself, but wills to be entirely the spirit of his virtue. Thus he strides, a spirit o'er the bridge. Him I love who from his virtue makes his peak and precipice, so he wills, for virtue's sake, to live and no more live. Him I love who has not willed too many virtues in his life, for one virtue is more virtue than two, and more a knot on which a precipice can hang. Him I love who prodigally spends his soul, who wants no thanks and gives none back, because he always gives, and will not look after himself. Him I love who reddens when the dice to him fall lucky, asking, Am I then a cheating player? For he wills to run aground. Him I love who golden words before his cards casts forth, yet always holds more than he pledged, thus he wills his undergoing. Him I love who justifies the future and the past redeems, for thus he wills to run aground upon the present moment. Him I love who canes his God, because he loves his God, for he must on the wrath of this his God run aground. Him I love whose soul is deep, even in the wounding, and upon a little life event can run aground, gladly goes he o'er the bridge. Him I love whose soul is over full, so that he loses of himself, for all things in him are, and thus all things become his undergoing. Him I love who is a spirit free and a free heart, thus his head is but the bowels of his heart, 
His heart, however, drives him to his undergoing. I love them all, these heavy raindrops, falling one by one out of the darkly cloud that overhangs humanity. They proclaim that the lightning comes, and in proclaiming, run aground. See, I am a herald of the lightning, and a heavy raindrop from the cloud, but this lightning is called the superhuman. When Zarathustra spake these words, he looked again upon the mob in silence. There they stand, he spake unto his heart, and there they laugh. They understand me not. I am not the mouth meant for these ears. Must I first grind upon their ears until they hear me with their eyes? Or must I prattle timpani and penance trays? Do they believe only the stammerer? What is it whereof they are proud? What do they call what makes them proud? They call it cultivation. It divides them from the goat herds. Since they listen only grudgingly of disdain for themselves, I will appeal unto their pride, and tell them of the thing most worthy of disdain. That, however, is the final man. And thus to the mob spake Zarathustra. It is high time that humankind should pin itself a target. It is high time that humankind should sow the seed of its highest hope. Still is its soil rich enough, but soon it shall be poor and tame, and no tall tree shall from it grow for evermore. Alas, it comes! the time when man no more shall cast the shaft of longing forth o'er humankind, and has the sinew of his bow forgotten how to whir. I tell you, one must still have chaos in oneself to birth a dancing star. I say, you still have chaos in you. But, oh, it comes, when humankind shall no more give birth to a star. Alas, it comes, the world of they most worthy of disdain, for they no more disdain themselves. See, I show to you the final man. What is love? What is creation? What is longing? What is a star? All this asks the final man, and blinks. In that day... The earth is small, and on it hops the final man, who makes all small. His type is ineradicable as the earthly flea. The final man lives longest. We have happiness invented, says the final man, and blinks. They have every clime departed where they found it hard to live, for one needs warmth. And one always their neighbor loves and rubs against them for their warmth. Mistrustfulness and illness count for them as sinfulness, so wary walk they hand in hand. A fool it is who stumbles still o'er stones or men, a little poison now and then, that makes for pleasant dreams, and finally a lot of poison for a pleasant death. One still labors, for one's labor is a recreation, but take care your recreation does not lay its hands on you. No more are any poor or rich, for both are much too burdensome. Who wants to rule? Who will obey? For both are much too burdensome. No herder and one herd. For everybody wills the same, and everybody is the same. Whoever feels it otherwise goes willingly into the madhouse. Formerly the world was mad, their finest say, and blink. One is shrewd, and knows all things that have occurred, and so their jibing has no end. And one still bickers, but one reconciles quickly, lest it spoil one's digestion. One has pleasures for the day and pleasures for the night, but always minds their health, for 
We have happiness invented, says the final man, and blinks. And here ended the first address of Zarathustra, which is called the Curtain Speech. For, at this point, there broke upon him shrieking, and the crowd's delight. Give unto us this final man, O Zarathustra, thus they cried. Turn us into final men, thus we'll give to you your supermen. And all the mob rejoiced and smacked their lips. Zarathustra, however, grew sorrowful, and spake unto his heart, They understand me not, I'm not the mouth meant for these ears. For too long lived I in the mountains, too much listing streams and trees. Now I talk to motley mobs as unto goat herders. Untroubled is my soul, and bright as mountains in the morning. But they think that I am cold, and a gibber of horrendous jokes. And now they look at me and laugh, and by their laughter hate me still, for in their laughter there is ice. But then did something happen that made all mouths dumb and eyes unblinking. For meanwhile the tightrope dancer had his work begun, and from a little door had he stepped out and gone across the rope, which was set up between two towers, so that o'er the market and the mob he overhung. But when he reached the middle point, once more the little door flew open, and a motley fellow, like a jester, sprang upon the rope, and went with flighty footsteps towards the first. And with a dreadful voice he shouted, Onwards, lame foot! Onwards, sloth, smuggler, sallow face! Lest I tickle you with my heel! What tugged you betwixt the towers? In the tower you belong, and boarded up you ought to be, for you are standing in the way of one far better and more free. And with each word came near and nearer, and when just a step behind him the most frightful thing occurred that made each mouth and every eye go mute and stare, the jester loosed a shriek just like a devil, and sprang over him, who blocked his way, who, when he saw his rival win, lost his head, and the rope too. He cast away his balance pole, and shot more swiftly than it down, a whirlpool of both arms and legs into the depths. The market and the mob resembled then a lake when storms drive in, all fled each other or each other, most of all away from where the corpse would hit the ground. But Zarathustra stayed in place, and right beside him crashed the corpse, foully mangled, cracked apart, but not yet dead. Eventually, the shattered man returned to consciousness, and saw, kneeling beside him, Zarathustra. What art thou still doing here? spake he at last. A long time have I known the fiend would trip me up, and now he drags me down to hell. Wilt thou contend with him for me? By my honor, friend beloved, answered Zarathustra, there is nil in all ye said. There is no devil nor hell. Thy soul shall die more quickly than thy body. Fear thou nothing more. The man looked on mistrustfully. If there is truth in what ye say, then I lose nil when I lose life. I am not much more than a beast that one has taught to dance by blows and meagre treats. Not so, spake Zarathustra. Thou hast made thy calling danger. There is not in that to scorn. And now by this thy calling go ye down into the ground. For this I'll bury thee with my own hands. When Zarathustra this had spoken, spake the dying one no more, but he moved his hand as if he sought in thanks the hand of Zarathustra.
In the meantime, evening came, and the market hid in darkness. Then the mob all went away, for even curiosity and horror become weary. Zarathustra, however, sat beside the dead man on the earth, and was so much in thinking sunken that he lost track of the time. But finally t'was night, and on the lonesome frigid breezes blew. Then arose he, Zarathustra, and spake thus unto his heart, Verily, a goodly fishing Zarathustra had to-day. No humans fished he, but apparently a corpse. Uncanny is the human being, and still as ever without meaning, even a jester can become its precipice. I will to teach humanity a meaning for their being, that the superhuman is the lightning from the darkling cloud of humankind. But I am still from them too far, the sense of my speeches ne'er reaches their senses. A middle am I yet for humankind, twixt knave and corpse. The night is dark, dark also are the ways of Zarathustra. Come, thou frigid rigor mortist fellow, I carry thee where I shall bury thee with my own hands. When Zarathustra spake these things unto his heart, loaded he the corpse upon his back, and made off down his path. Yet after not a hundred paces crept a man right up to him, and whispered in his ear, and see, the speaker was the jester from the tower, From this city go thy way, O Zarathustra, whispered he, there are too many here who hate thee, good and righteous people hate thee, and they call thee foe and their despiser, and those who believe the right beliefs all hate thee too, and call thee public enemy. Ye should be glad they only laughed, and truly talked ye like a jester. Be ye glad that ye associated with that fallen dog, for by this thine abasement thou thyself art delivered to-day. But from this city get away, or on the morrow I'll spring over thee, one livelier over one dead. And when this he had spoken, the man vanished into air. But Zarathustra kept on through the darkened alleyways. At the city gates encountered he the grave-diggers, and with a torch illumined they his face, then recognized they Zarathustra, and they sneered all over him. Zarathustra bears away the fallen dog. How good of Zarathustra to become a grave-digger, for our hands are too cleanly for this roast. Zarathustra maybe wills to steal a morsel from the devil? Tally-ho, and good luck with your supper. Lest the devil is a better thief than Zarathustra, he'll steal them both, he'll eat them both. And they laughed with one another, knocking both their heads together. Not a word to them, said Zarathustra, but continued on his way. But when he had two hours travelled, past the forests and the swamps, so much of the hungry howling of the wolves he heard, that he himself began to hunger. So at a lonesome house he halted, in the which a light was burning. Hunger sets upon me like a robber, Zarathustra said, in forests and in swamps, and in deep night my hunger sets upon me. Wondrous caprices has my hunger. Often comes he only after dinner-time, and not once came he this entire day. But whence then did he stay? Then Zarathustra beat upon the house's door. An old man came, held aloft the house's light, and asked, Who comes to me into my awful sleep? One living and one dead, Zarathustra said. Give me meat and drink, for I forgot them in the day, and he who with the hungry dines refreshes his own soul. So wisdom speaks. The old one disappeared, but soon came back, 
and offered Zarathustra bread and wine. An evil region this unto the hungry, said the man, which is why I dwell here. Beasts and men come unto me, the hermit. But do bid ye thy companion also eat and drink, for he is wearier than thee. Zarathustra answered, Dead is my companion. I can scarcely talk him into that. That is no concern of mine, said the old man sullenly. He who knocks upon my house must also take of what I bid them. Eat, and be ye well. Afterwards went Zarathustra two hours again, trusting on the path and on the starry light, for he was used to night walking, and loved to look into the faces of all of the sleepers. But when the morning dawned, Zarathustra found himself within a forest deep, and no path showed itself to him any more. There he set the corpse within a hollow tree, beside his head, for he wanted to protect him from the wolves, as he laid himself upon the ground and on the moss, and straightway he was in a sleep, weary of body, untroubled of soul. Long slept Zarathustra, and not just the red of morning passed over his countenance, but the rest of morning too. Finally he oped his eyes, bewildered, Zarathustra saw into the stillness of the woods, bewildered, saw into himself. Then he raised himself apace, and like a mariner who of a sudden spotted land, rejoiced Zarathustra, for he spotted a new truth. And thus he spake unto his heart, A light has lighted on me. It's companions that I need, and live ones, not companions dead nor corpses, that I carry with me where I will. But live companions need I, who will follow me because they will to follow after themselves, where I will. A light has lighted on me, not unto the mob, speaks Zarathustra, but unto companions. Zarathustra should not be a shepherd, nor a hound of sheep, to lure off many from the herd. That is why I've come. The mob and herd shall rage against me. Robber will the shepherds call me. I say shepherds, but they call themselves the good and righteous. I say shepherds, but they call themselves believers of the right beliefs. See the good and righteous. Who is it they hate the most? He who breaks their value tablets. Even the breaker, the law breaker. Even such are the creators. See the faithful of all faiths. Who is it they hate the most? He who breaks their value tablets. Even the breaker, the law breaker. Even such are the creators. Creators seek companionship. Not from corpses, nor from flocks, nor faithful, for creators seek for co-creators, they who inscribe values new on tablets new. Creators seek companions and co-harvesters, for all stands ripe for ready harvest, but one lacks one hundred sickles, one by one one plucks the ears annoyedly. So the Creator seeks for companions, and those who know how to sharpen their sickles, they'll be called annihilators, they who disdain good and evil. But the harvesters are they, and celebrants, for I seek after co-creators, co-harvesters and co-celebrants Zarathustra seeks. How could I create with herds and herders and pale corpses? So to thee, my first companion, fare thee well. It's good I buried thee within this hollow tree. It's good I sheltered thee from hungry wolves. But I must part ways from thee. The time has come. Twixt morning red and morning red a new truth came to me. No herder shall I be, nor digger of the graves. No more shall I speak to the mob, and for this last time shall I speak unto the dead. The creators, the harvesters, the celebrants will I unto me associate, and show unto them the rainbow, and every step unto the superhuman. To hermaphrodites and hermits will I sing my song, and all who still have ears for the unheard of, 
I will make their hearts heavy with all my joy. To my target I will go, to my going go I, or the hesitant and clumsy I shall overspring, thus may my going be their undergoing. When Zarathustra spake all this unto his heart, at midday stood the sun. Then, in curiosity, he looked into the heights, for overhead he heard the sharp reporting of a bird, and see, an eagle drawing circles wide across the air, while from him hung a serpent, not as prey, but as his friend, for by rings she held herself around the eagle's throat. It is my beasts, said Zarathustra, and was happy from the bottom of his heart. The proudest beast under the sun, the shrewdest beast under the sun, they have come forth on reconnaissance, for they desire to find out if Zarathustra's still alive. Truly, do I still live? Far more dangerous found I to be among humanity than among the animals. On dangerous roads goes Zarathustra. May my animals guide me. When Zarathustra this had said, remembered he the words the holy man had spoken in the woods, then sighed, and spake unto his heart, Oh, that I were shrewder, even shrewd from ground on up, just as my serpent is. But what I ask is impossible. So instead, I ask my pride to ever travel with my shrewdness, and if my shrewdness leaves one day, and, oh, she loves to fly away, my pride will with my folly fly instead. Thus began Zarathustra's undergoing.